painting, what is the painting the studio landscape? Yes. Finalizing yeah. your study in the studio. That's right. Great. So it'll be good. And so tonight we're just painting the beautiful Cabrina. Uh, and we we got started maybe five minutes ago. Um, Not long as you can tell. <laughs> got everything it's done. It's proof. <laughs> so, so welcome everybody. Sorry about that. And uh, I don't think we set a timer for a model, so we have to. You're doing a great job. Though. This is Cabrina's first time modeling for artists. And we'll be taking questions later on uh, at the beginning. We're not going to do a lot of. Um, the whole idea behind this is so you guys can join us as we do what we love to do, which is paint from life, paint what we want to paint. Um, it's not necessarily like a tutorial, so um, please ask us anything other than what color we're mixing. Um, I am using a lot of alizarin right now, just in case. <laughs> it's interesting. Why, why did you choose to do that? What, that seems like a very bold move. Uh, well, the uh, the light is this soft, cool light, and I have a lot of her hair in shadow here, and it's just this really rich, warm shadow, at least as I see it. So um, it's kind of it's going to function as my underpainting. Okay. Let me actually get there. So we have three hours. I was just as the cameras were turned off and blabbing away. We were just kind of talking about uh, how this has been a part of our kind of education, how uh, painting the portrait sketch has kind of worked into most uh, studio environments. So TJ, if you want to reiterate, just uh, maybe kind of, yeah. it's, you don't do it a lot, but it's part of yeah, so I consider myself a, a landscape painter, and I think that painting portraits is a really, really valuable way um, to maintain sort of that mental precision that you can lose as a landscape painter, because the landscape, as far as uh, certain aspects of drawing, is much more forgiving than uh, the yeah. portrait. Yeah. And, and that's... Uh, you can just, at least I can, um, you can play around with the landscape and experiment a lot more than you can with the portrait. Absolutely. Um, so anyway, that's... That's the way you turn it. I just never want to lose that ability to be precise. Mm. Welcome, Lewis, to the, to the fall. Hey, yeah. made it. <laughs> this always seems to be, I always have to work out this last little kinks before I can actually get started. <laughs> I think you saved the day, though, right? Oh, well, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I hope, I hope that uh, it helped, at least. <laughs> we so I have think, a question. All right. Okay, Let's hear so it. Um, Maru T asks, do you stick with mostly one brand of paint, or do you use various brands in your palette? And what brands are your go-to paints? Would love more info on your palette. All right, I, I use mostly Winsor Newton and Old Holland just because I got used to it. Um, I think that the good paint manufacturers out there are Michael Harding and Rublev, but uh, you use what you like, right? Yeah. I use Camblin. Through and through? Through and through, yeah. They, I, I just, uh, they have been uh, consistently good for me. And I, and I also, I also um, know they're a small company, or at least they were 
I don't know. Uh, I guess maybe they were purchased at some point. But anyway, I think they're still a small company, which I like, in uh, Washington, so. Oh, nice. But I just really, I really love their colors, so. That's awesome. I, um, I have a, a, quite an assortment. Um, so I use uh, Old Holland and Michael Harding in my sort of earth tones. So my oxide red, oxide yellow, raw umber, black, and raw sienna, they're all either Old Holland or Michael Harding. And then um, I have my Viridian is, uh, my Viridian and Sap Green are Old Holland, but I then have uh, Manganese Violet that I think is Gamblin, and a Cobalt Violet that's Gamblin. And then the I have one or two Rublev colors, which is Vermilion, and my white is their number one lead white that they have. So I just, I, I experiment a little bit of what I like and it might be some sort of transparency property or, or something like that that I particularly enjoy about a, a particular color or maybe it's, it's vibrancy when you mix it with another color that I like and then I kind of go from there. Do you guys like experiment around with your colors at all? Like you add a, a paint color to your palette and then take it off? Definitely. I even have like remnants of like old paint colors that are still sort of on my palette uh, from times just experimenting with them uh, that I don't like use now. Um, it's sort of evolutionary too. I, I mean, I'll, I'll start with one, but then like I might run out of it and they might not have it in stock and so I get a different brand and then I go, oh, well, I actually really like that color and that brand. Huh. And so that's sometimes how it's happened too. I do it very little, even though I want to do it more. It's one of those things where what I actually want to do, I saw there's an old Holland set of like, I don't know how many colors. Mm -hmm. it, it was like maybe 80 colors as a box. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And I, I want to get it because I would, I'd rather do it that way, but I can yeah. reach a lot of the colors with my palette. So I have high chroma. I have a high chroma yellow, high chroma red, and blue, basically. And so that allows me to get on the outer edge of the spectrum. Yeah, so that's awesome. Keep it limited. I, mean, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine colors, and then um, black and white. So Carrie Mon has a question. Okay. She says, what is the reason you mount your palettes vertically? Oh, that's good because I think, I'm sure, I'm sure that you'd be mounting your pad, palette vertically as well if, if we had a <laughs> tripod ready for you. <laughs> um, the reason I uh, mount my pad or my palette vertically is because the same light direction and light source is hitting my palette as well as my panel. So when I'm mixing my color, it's gonna be more true to what I'm expecting it to look like when I put it on here. If it's in a different light source, sometimes the color might be brighter because if this is a less light facing plane than my palette, my palette's facing the light more, it's gonna get more intense and a little bit brighter and so I'll mix this like bright color and then I'll put it on there and it might look a bit more dull. So by doing it this way, it's actually easier for me to like switch over and know exactly what color I'm putting on there. And honestly, it's a convenience thing. I don't like to have to like dip down when my palette is here and then go up. I, it's just easier for me to go here to here to here to here. So it's also sort of a speed thing. It's a good question. Yeah, I don't know if she can, can you see my palette in the picture? I don't think so, right? Yeah. Um, you can? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, a little bit of it? So I can see your palette, or no, 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 never mind. Yeah, no, okay. 
Uh, mine's just vertical right underneath my painting. Um, but honestly, you can, you, vertical's nice because it's right there. It's like with the edge booger boxes, it's just so convenient. Um, but there, there is like an art to holding your palette properly. <laughs> and it's amazing that how many people don't know how to do it. Mm. It's, you know, there's a thumb hole and your brushes go underneath the palette and your rag or paper towel, you have your thumb holding all of it together. So your palette's right here and you hold it in a grip. And like people use their palette upside down, they, they don't understand that like you can put your rag on top and hold it with your thumb. It's just, it's like, you can imagine someone picking up a violin and like if I pick up a violin, I have no clue mm. what's the proper technique, how to hold the palette. Mm. So there is actually an art to it, but... Um, do you ever hold your palette? I did for a long time, and I do sometimes, but typically it's just, this is so comfortable, it's so easy that uh, you get into habits and mm -hmm. you forget to go back to the other way, but... I have a new wave palette that I could hold, but usually I just have it on my tab array. Mm -hmm. Those are nice. Yeah, I, I, I held a new way for a very long time, but um, then once I got this Edge Pro, I, I just was like, I'm going to try it out to just paint in, paint in the studio, and now I almost paint all of my stuff on it just because I, I like painting on glass, it's easy to clean, um, that's like one of the main reasons I like it, and because I can turn it vertical. But Alex paints on a new way, and he just turns it vertical and puts it in one of these metal um, easels. You yeah, got just a couple minutes um, until break, because we started late, so. She's doing a great job. Yeah, you're yeah. fantastic. So we have another question from Jihu Jihu. Um, has anyone had any issues with repetitive strain injuries or tendonitis from painting for long periods of time? If so, what adjustments did you make to your painting routine or posture? And if not, do you guys stretch or anything prior to putting in long hours? I've been out of commission for six weeks after a 70 hour painting mm -hmm. week, and I can't find any other artists who have had this issue. Uh, I, I mean, I think it can be common if you if you strain and hold your brushes really tight. Um, do they do they say their wrists? Was it their wrists? They said. Yeah. He's uh, trying to use your whole arm to make brush strokes. Right, right, right. Is a. Uh, overdoing it, I guess. I don't paint more than like three hours in a row. Um, you should take a break every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Try to take a break every half hour. Speaking of, you can take a break. Right. Break time. <laughs> How was it the first 20 minutes? It was good. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Jocelyn says something in response, and if you do this a lot, Lewis, um, it says, she says, I think if you walk back, and look at your painting every now and then, and just walk and loosen up. When you do that, you can prevent this. And you walk back and take like a different perspective of your painting. All the time. Quite a bit. I guess, yeah, I guess a lot of moving around. As far as like tendonitis in like my hand or, or anything, I mean, there used to be times where I would like be holding like a palette in a weird way, where I wasn't holding my arm like this. Instead, I'd be like holding it as if I was holding a notebook. And that would like be painful after a period of time. But <clears throat> as far as um, as far as like other like aches and pains in painting, I used to paint sitting down a lot um, when I was in my earlier part of my career. And when you're painting sitting down, you're like bending over a whole lot to paint. And over time, that was like straining on my back. So I started learning, you know, training my body to paint standing and it's really helped not only with my posture but uh, it's also helped because I can get a lot closer without ever straining my back if I need to. Mm. Um, 
And so those are the only other aches and pains I've had. And uh, honestly, I, I recommend stretching in any way you want to, whether it be mm -hmm. yoga practices or, or just getting up and doing morning stretches. You know, um, I, I wish I did it even more than I do because uh, I just think it's, it's helpful. Anything that you're doing repetitively can over time be straining. Yeah. So. It's got to be something where she's not taking a break or something, you know, just to, to get like mm -hmm. serious cramping or pain. You just yeah. got to take a break. Yeah. Um, maybe like do a, some sort of stretch routine. Maybe you can go to like a physical therapist to see what a good stretch routine is for whatever the tendonitis thing is in your hand. Once you've got tendonitis, I've heard it's just really difficult to get rid of. I mean, I know. Okay. And whenever I've played stored sports and gotten it, it, it's a tough thing to, over time, get rid of if you continue to do the thing that caused it in the first place. Yeah. But um, that might be helpful, is to find out what, a good stretch routine from a physical therapist for it. So Axmelon has a question. Um, how important is blocking into your process? Um, anybody want to take that? Okay. Uh, <laughs> really important. So, <laughs> I, I think in, in the process, I mean, it depends on our, and for me, I just try to separate. Um, I think of everything all at once. So I'm thinking of the color, the form, the brush art, the, the two dimensional shapes. Uh, so, I'm just trying to keep it generalized and get a s sense of feeling for it rather than. Uh, accuracy at this point and so um, a block-in I think people often refer to a block-in as kind of a rigid two-dimensional uh, structure that then you would model over top of and so it depends on what you mean by block-in but uh, there's a question how important it is mm -hmm. to your process yeah. how important, yeah. important is it to your so my answer would be it's uh, depending on how you phrase what a blocking is, it's not important um, in the sense that I'm trying to find really accurate two-dimensional shapes. I say, uh, like, I think a blocking is the establishment of the composition. So in a head study, not that important as far as composition goes, but I'm blocking in uh, a landscape. It's right. super, super important that everything goes where it needs yeah. to go. So. Sure. Do that's you do the little one. thumbnail sketches and stuff? Yeah, yeah. But that's the one. Um, so I like to listen to podcasts and uh, books and things while I'm painting. And the block in is the time when I can't do that. I just I need to really, <laughs> really focus on yeah. what I'm doing. Yeah. So um, I spend the most time in the block in. Uh, I'll spend days and block in because I mm -hmm. just want things because when you're working in portraiture and if likeness is the most the thing you mm -hmm. value the most mm -hmm. for me it's in the strong drawing stage and so for me it really is very very important it takes me mm -hmm. I always tell people I'm a slow starter but I'm a great anchor <laughs> so like I'm not I'm not good at this, the start but I always tend to like lock things in really well at the end mm -hmm. um, so you finished strong. Yep. Is that a five minute break? We were keeping track. Probably not. Yeah, I'll give you a couple of another minute or two. Just take a little bit longer. Yeah. So our model, Cabrina, is a hairstylist. So if anyone has any questions about the latest trends and fashions, <laughs> yes. you can uh, ask her about what's. And if she you're has in the great North... hair, by the way. Fabulous hair. If you're in the North Raleigh area, look her up. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk about lighting. We have two different people asking about lighting. Um, first person is Carrie. She says, are each of you fussy about how much light is on your workstation or do you accept whatever conditions there are? Uh, no. <laughs> except no, whatever conditions there are. <laughs> and then we have another question that asks, uh, can you discuss studio lighting? Much research, got cool 5000K CFL bulbs, but this feels too blue to me. My studio faces south, and I had hoped to balance that warm light. Okay, so basically, we're talking about lighting situations if you didn't hear the question. Um, we're using an LED light that 
Does the, the Kelvin fluctuate here? Or is it just... Uh, no, no, the exact light doesn't. No, it's 5600 Kelvin. It is? Yeah. Okay. So, and so it's a very cool daylight light. Almost like a gray, kind yeah, of overcast day. Exactly. If it's a really bright cloud day, okay. um, is what it's trying to mimic. The brand is Aperture. And there it's Aperture 120D. And if you look it up uh, on like B&H, you can find it. They're really nice lights. Yeah. Um, and then natural light is different because it shifts all the time. Uh, and some artists prefer a, a steady light versus a shifting light. If it's sunny one day, if it's cloudy. In her scenario, if she had south light, you're just going to have to block or diffuse the light and kind of make it do what you want it to do. Um, you know, experiment with different lights. See what you like. I remember when I started my studies in New York, uh, I went from a school that was all natural light to a studio where they were literally using just a light bulb, like a normal uh, incandescent. Yeah. Uh, one that you'd put in your lamp. Like and it was just so warm. And but we we were able to work with it and create really beautiful paintings. It just is the the range of color is going to be limited. It's not going to reflect the entire spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, so, and but then what happens? This is a common. You paint something in your studio, and then you send it to the gallery, and they have a different light source. Yeah. And so it's viewed in a different light source in the gallery, and then the person who buys it takes it home, and they put it in a different light source. So you just have to understand that basically your painting is going to go through a series of. It's not going to look like what you're looking at in the, in the studio, regardless. Yeah, you almost need to like give an instruction manual with your painting. It probably says, be a really good idea. Like it says, use this kind of lighting at a 45 degree angle of 5600 Kelvin at the brightness of so many so, you know, 300 or 3000 lumens. <laughs> That'd be great. Something that I have found, um, or that I, I, I sort of learned the hard way, is having too much light on your canvas. Mm. Um, and when you're planar painting, you never want direct sunlight on your um, on your canvas because the only time your painting will ever look good is if it's in direct sunlight, mm -hmm. which I think makes the lifespan of the painting very very short. So, but anyway, if you have really bright lights in your studio. Um, you can end up painting too dark. So I try to paint with as little light as possible on my canvas and palette is I assume that my collectors are going to put them in hallways mm. and living rooms that yeah. don't necessarily have very good lighting. Stairways, like all these places mm. where they see them as bright places but they're not really, especially compared to this really mm -hmm. intense light. So you're saying you hate our light source? <laughs> oh, I love your light source. Yeah, so as I'm like working here, it. and I'm like have light blasting but, on <laughs> they, they They'll look good here, right? No. That's so funny. Um, yeah, I actually have talked to my clients before and said, okay, this, this painting needs light. Like, you need to put a lot of light on it. Because like when I first started, painting I did just that I would blast all this light because I was like I need to get like the most subtle colors right exactly you know and then um, that exact thing would happen where it was kind of quite dark and I so I would like preface beforehand and, and I would present it in like a very well lit space so that um, it would look like it was when I was painting it yeah So Griffin641 asks, what color do you use, or what colors do you use to modify meaning to gray down your basic red and yellow mixtures? Okay. I didn't quit. But yeah, just what color do you use yeah. to gray down your like yellows and reds, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, 
you go for it. I mean, yeah. there's, <clears throat> there's tutorials on YouTube of this explaining the very thing. Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll tell you like my, my, my favorite sort of combinations to neutralize colors. So I typically use, um, in, in the lower light situation when I'm like doing shadows and in some of the midtones, I use transparent oxide yellow and transparent oxide red. And I have two basic neutralizers for those two colors. So for transparent oxide yellow, I use manganese violet. And then that doesn't quite neutralize it completely. It makes it a very warm, warm neutral. So how I shift it is I use a little bit of, of French ultramarine blue, and that ends up tilting it straight into uh, as neutral as you need it to go. The other one is, is just going straight into transparent oxide red and uh, ultramarine blue. And then both of those neutralize each other quite well. So um, that helps a lot. And then if I'm using uh, raw sienna, which is typically what I'll use in the midtones to the light, um, I will neutralize it with, um, yet again, manganese violet or um, alizarin crimson will tend to give me a flesh tone that I really like um, in the higher notes, in the warmer notes. And then I tend to neutralize that with a viridian. Uh, green so um, so that hopefully that helps another great neutralizer that I like is to do um, uh, my vermilion with viridian and they tend to make a really pretty neutral color so that's basically just mixing red and green together mm -hmm. so TJ Homer asks um, do you find doing figurative painting improves your landscape painting? And if so, how? By the way, um, he's viewing from Fort Hood, Texas, but a native Middle Tennessean, and really love your work. Oh, that's great. That's Thanks, awesome. Homer. So, yeah, I, I think that the, the landscape, because it's so, it can be more forgiving of drawing. Whenever you have anatomy, you have to be so specific and that is so I, I feel that doing figurative work really really helps maintain that precision that I do want to bring to my landscape painting so that would be the the main and it's also just um, it's great to switch subjects you know it's really um, something that uh, Everett Raymond Kinsler, who was a great, uh, very recently uh, passed away, but he was a, I think he painted seven presidents' official portraits. He's just a phenomenal wow. portrait painter. And people would ask him, how, how did you get so good at painting portrait? And he would say, by plein air paint. Okay. And so I think the same is true of of, um, of landscape, landscape painting. That's so interesting. Yeah, it was very compelling and very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Who was that the door? Yeah, I, I stepped out for half a second, so um, it was our Christmas cards. Yeah, there you go. So Paul Parker asks, um, thanks for doing this. Can you guys speak to how to avoid over rendering and over modeling your painting as you pursue the finish? Limit yourself to three hours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. I think, um, man. I'm not, um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank at the moment. <laughs> the, com the common thing would be to squint and step back. Mm -hmm. I think those are. Um, to not over render. Uh, think about the structure of the head versus the detail of the eye, things like mm -hmm. that. Like think of the eye socket versus the eyelash. Um, be interested in more than just the the, the likeness. I think. I think when mm -hmm. when it's only about the likeness is when you tighten up and, and you want to make it. 
Absolutely. Perfect. If you just have this kind of freedom. I think it it's, tends to be a little bit of a philosophical thing too. That like, if you're okay with a drifting answer, usually you don't have to tighten up. It's yeah. just kind of is what it is. But. And then Michael, um, Afnan is asking, are you getting back to figure in portrait painting? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Actually, um, I'm resisting doing a lot of florals because I'm a typical artist, and anytime something becomes commercially successful, it's like poison to my. <laughs> no, I just I don't want to be labeled as a, a, a floral artist. So the temptation's there because. They sell, but um, I can't. I can't just do that. Mm -hmm. So I have been doing more sketches, and also uh, I did that demo for face. So I was trying to get a technique. The difference between my flower painting and my figurative work is I have a technique in flower painting. So what I want to do is I want to gravitate towards creating my own kind of technique for portrait and figurative stuff. Because I think it's essential if you're going to teach, you got to have something to say. Mm -hmm. Jeff asks, please discuss the mediums that you like and how you use them. Well, I, um, I typically, I, I keep it really simple. Um, I've never been one to overcomplicate my medium stuff. I take linse half linseed oil and half turf, uh, and I use Gam Saw as my solvent, and I just mix it in. Literally, I'm, I use like an old linseed oil jar, mix half of it in the other half, I'll, and I'll swirl it around for a little bit to get it mixed up, and then I'll just dip into it, and I usually use that in the beginning stages. The only other medium I use, the middle stages, I typically don't use anything, um, and then I, I do a glazing. Uh, layer near the end of my paintings, and I'll use um, oleo gel for for that, which I typically keep right up here. So uh, oleo gel is made by Rublev Company, and it basically is a an alkyd, and um, it's I think its main base is linseed oil, isn't it, Michael? Yeah. So. Um, so it's an, it's an alkyd made from linseed oil, and uh, I typically use that at the end to, to glaze with, and that's it. Uh, I don't use anything else aside from that and paint in just regular turpentine. Yeah, the, the, the rule of thumb I think on that is keep it simple um, and just understand that if you're, if you're layering the paint, you have to add oil to it. Mm -hmm. If you are on your third layer and you cut into it with Gamsol or turpentine, it's gonna it's gonna eat away at the, the, mm -hmm. the layer, the paint layer. So as you get further along in the piece, you wanna add more medium, whatever it is. It, it's it's a way of allowing the paint to dry quicker or, or slower. Um, and so it's kinda like anything else, you experiment with it, read about it. What it does, try it, and if you like it, then use it. If not, um, use something else, but just don't overdo it. I, I like to use Gamblin's Galkid Gel. So it's it's just an Alkid Gel um, that they've named Galkid. And it's, so it makes, the, makes my paint shiny, helps with flow, and, um, the reason I started using it is because, like any other gel, you can put it on your palette with the rest of your paints and it will stay there. So in plein air painting, especially with, when you have your palette at an angle, um, having little cups full of medium, they never, uh, I, I always build them. So it's sort of a convenience thing to use a gel for me. Do mm. you ever use the solventry free gel? I, I did use their solvent-free gel, and I didn't like it. Didn't have the same luster. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
the the health risks are worth the shiny paint. Yep. No, I get it. Um, I used the solvent-free gel um, for a while before I started using the gam or the um, polio gel, and I actually really liked the, a, a particular property that it had because it kind of granulated a little bit of the pigment when I was doing the glazing method and gave it a particular texture that I, a color texture that I liked. So, or a pigment texture. So, but at the end of the day, I liked the control I had over the oleo gel that I didn't seem to have. And I also had just a touch of an impasto look to the oleo gel that the solvent free gel didn't have. But I tell people it's, it's good too. Have either of you used cold wax? No, I've never used cold wax. It's a, it's a fun, fun one to play with. I was, I painted a plein air in the freezing cold and I love the quality of when you're applying paint that's really stiff. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was trying to mimic that in the studio and the uh, wax did a pretty good job doing that. And then I did, I used it again in another piece right away and got carried away with it. So it's sort of <laughs> like that. A little garlic powder is good. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And then you never want anything with garlic powder <laughs> ever again. <laughs> I think a lot of people like do that. They'll they'll try something they get really excited about, and they overdo that thing, and then they go, "Oh, maybe I should pull back the reins a little bit." So Paul Barker says, thanks, great answers and very helpful. By the way, Michael, I love the pigeon painting you parted with. I have it hanging in my studio and uh, it serves as an inspiration every day. Thanks excellent. So much. Is that the one that was in the hole? Like yeah. the, that's awesome. Thanks, Paul. That's really nice. I saw the post that, that you um, yeah. ended up selling that one. I remember when you painted that one. Yeah, that was a special piece. Too. It's one of those ones that you paint. You never know if it's ever going to sell, but you do it because you love it. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you people out there that, that love our passion and see it in our work. Well, like sometimes that makes it sell better <laughs> when you're not trying to make it for anyone. Yeah. So TJ, I have a question for you. Yes. Um, with landscapes, um, do you have like a, a location that you find the most memorable or the most, um, where like the conditions were perfect and you would say that that was like one of the, um, yeah, memorable, most memorable locations? So a location that I would choose to go back to? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the two, my two very favorite places to paint are Cambridge, Vermont, and Stonington, Maine, so far. Those are, you know, those are just amazing places. Um, Cambridge is where I'm from originally, so it has that, but also um, Aldro Hibbard and the rest of the k Fan school used to come to Cambridge and paint together. So um, that's kind of a neat thing. So I felt like I discovered it, and then you see these. I see these paintings that are of the exact same buildings and mountains. Oh, that that's are, cool. That's awesome. You know, they were painted well before I was born. Um, so New England is. I'm a, I am a New Englander, so there's kind of all the good spots are are taken. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, so you just kind of you just kind of jump in and enjoy yourself. But I have painted out west some. Um, but I, I still, I just love, I love the, uh, sort of rugged yet quaint feeling of the, uh, old New England towns mm -hmm. and Stonington and, uh, Cambridge are my favorites. 
And do you find that the collectors are typically in that area? People are... Yeah. So, yeah. It's, uh, so landscape is very regional. Okay. Really very... I, but the, the craziest is I painted a, a, a very sort of beaten down looking old Vermont uh, barn that was built in the 1980s and, you know, losing paint and entered it in a, a show in Tucson and it sold immediately. No joke. So this super gray, dreary painting in Tucson. But I found out later that the collectors were from Boston. So. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, all right, that makes sense now. But I was uh, wondering. One of the recently I had a piece, and so I, I of course had the inspiration from Vermont. Um, I say of course I had plein air studies, and I but I completed it in my studio in Tennessee. Finished it just in time for the show. Shipped it up. And it was the first piece to sell and sold to a collector in North Carolina and was headed to North Carolina very shortly. So <laughs> started, the, the, the idea began in Vermont, <laughs> down to Tennessee, back up to Vermont, then back to North Carolina. So I thought that was pretty funny. That is funny. Well-traveled painting. How are you doing, Mark? Right? Yeah, it's a Yes, yeah, probably been. Have you? Did you? Uh, I haven't been timing it. Oh, okay. Well, I'll start the timing. Yeah. Take a right. take a little break. Take a break. That's my son. Just like so relaxed. I'm like meditating. You're doing you're doing <laughs> great, by the way. There's nothing like talking to painters talk about or listening to painters <laughs> talk about painting, right? It all it all make you go to sleep. <laughs> Is your finger twitching yet to go to your phone? Is that like you can't? See, not? I like <laughs> 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 Good practice. Right. All right, let's see here. You do some chair yoga. Yeah, how's your neck? How's it, everything feeling? It's good. 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 Tell you, I've, I've been the portrait model multiple times, and every time my neck gets so stiff. I have to like, stretch it out. So while we're on break uh, to entertain everybody, there's, uh, TJ's doing the live stream workshop this week, starting tomorrow at 10. Tomorrow at 10. And we have a special offer just for the people watching. So yep. It's YouTube 35. Mm -hmm. YouTube 35 is the code. And you get 35% off. 35% mm -hmm. off, uh, and it's good through Friday. For his live stream. Yeah, for his live stream. So this is only the people that watch this YouTube and get this code. Before the 13th. Yep. And we'll, we'll announce that multiple times through the thing, but. Um, YouTube 35. Yep. And they can, uh, they can come in on Friday and watch the other two days. Yep, yep. So later. once you purchase it, you always have access to it. That's it. So I'm going to do Instagram live video. Oh, awesome. Do it. As well. Okay, you got to do it from every angle, right? <laughs> Just yeah. Otherwise, people will say, how come you didn't tell me? So Paul Barker asks, do you guys find value in occasionally doing master copies of artists you admire or have studied? So, um, not too long ago, I did a master copy of William Trotz Richards. He was a seascape painter, kind of hung out with the Hudson River School cats, but he did seascape painting instead of landscape painting. And I'm a huge admirer of his work. And one of my favorite paintings of his, I ended up doing a master's copy just to study how he painted. And um, 
I, I, I definitely recommend it um, so that you can learn more about, like, really investigate paintings and, like, how they were trying to accomplish and what they were using in their brushstrokes, what kind of paint they're using, you know, and kind of go through the whole process as sort of deconstructing um, how they painted the piece. So um, I definitely recommend doing that. I think it's been very helpful for me. So hey everybody that is joining us live on Instagram, we are actually live over on our website. So if you want um, East Oak Studio, a better there. angle of all these paintings as they are created, you can go to eastoakstudio.com. Um, it's free session, you don't have to pay for it. So join us, we're going to be live for a couple more hours, mm -hmm. I think, yep. until 9 o'clock. So you have plenty of time to uh, see the beautiful Cabrina and her <laughs> lovely, everyone's uh, commenting how lovely her hair is. <laughs> is that a natural curl? Is that yeah. Natural? <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. All right, see you, see you over there, everybody. It's one of those stages of where I go, okay, now it's time to start playing around and actually put some paint on this thing. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's get back to those. I gotta come see it. Uh, come was see it, it. Uh, was it five minutes? Was that more or less? How are you feeling? You want a little bit longer? Or you... okay. there you go. Cabrina, are you excited to see I these paintings? <laughs> <laughs> So whenever I can, I always want the model to see them yeah. at like a stage before, so that by the time yeah. it gets to the end, I'm impressed. <laughs> yeah, because uh, yeah, because always at the very beginning, it's like, oh, after three hours, I'm worried your expectations will be too high if you don't see what they look like and yep. what mine looked like in the beginning. That's a smart move, man. We might need to do that midway through. Yeah. You're supposed to do it the first twenty minutes. Shit, shit, shit. Supposed happen. to do it at the first model break. <laughs> But that's the exact opposite of portrait commissions, right? Because oh yeah, no, yeah. You, your your clients will worry oh, yeah. so much if you show them that first stage, they will not leave you alone. Yeah, yeah, no, um, no shop talk with clients. Nope, <laughs> I, I never I never show my clients the work until the the actual unveiling day. Uh, they get to see a study sketch and they get to see a, a color study, and that's all they get, um, and that that's enough to hold them over. That's interesting. That's yeah. Interesting. That's always been sort of something I've done. Now, you, you show for the first time in person then? Yep. Uh, hand deliver every painting. Now, what, like, what happens, maybe this has never happened, but what if they're like, uh, we, we really don't like this or like that? Like, how do you, do you just like, okay, well, I'll put it back in the truck and we'll see you in a month? Like, how do you? <laughs> uh, I, I definitely have something that's, in my policy that it's like I want them to be 100% happy and part of showing them a study sketch and showing them the color study is um, really takes out any bad expectation that they might have of what they're getting okay. so the study sketches to show likeness so and you color do studies. really 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 careful study sketches yeah, yeah. they're for, really for mm -hmm. okay are you familiar with uh, Joe Bowler um, not by his name. That was his practice. Oh yeah. I think so. Uh, yeah, I learned that from um, the gentleman who I watched painting growing up, and that was part of his process. And I just enjoyed the fact that that was part of his process. So, um, Michael, what is holding your palette below your panel? Uh, so, if you click on my on my um, painting really quick, mm -hmm. on my angle, yeah. I'll just lift it up. Yep. So I have, I just have a glass. Um, it's the Edge Pro Gear uh, glass palette, and I just put it on another um, section of the easel. So this tripod easel comes with uh, it comes with two 
but so I just took one off of a, a different easel and um, have it right below my painting. Oh, it's funny, I thought that was a cutting board. This is the edge profile. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cutting board. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> that's a great, that's a great uh, thing. I mean, you can paint on anything. Find yourself a cutting board. Go paint on it. <laughs> Actually, you don't need anything fancy? Yeah. <laughs> Grab a piece of cardboard. Yep. An extra panel is a good thing in a pinch. Yeah. As a as a palette. As a palette, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, JD asks, I'm in my second year in a classical atelier. The whole year is based around value, painting in black and white. Do you have any tips for achieving realism using only value? Uh, wow. I, I think that most, most of your realism is actually found in, in your value. Um, so I think the practice of training yourself with black and white is, is one of the better practices it, because what you're doing is you're limiting all the di different variables aside from that one thing. Um, I would say that, that the way we were taught and trained is understanding the light most facing planes and understanding where the light source is coming from and then using that to your advantage of helping you understand form and the, this three-dimensional object that's in space. And then there's just lots of like mind hacks that they would kind of walk you through to help you kind of understand how that light was hitting that plane and going away from the light. So um, that and coming out of the shadow and using a, a, a locking in a, uh, the color that's going to be your dark color and the, and the light that's going to be your lightest light and then working in between those two is, uh, you know, I would find myself having a pitfall at the beginning because I would then go, oh, I need to make my shadow even darker, and then I'd make it darker, and then like it would have to, it would readjust how the light would fall value range wise on the three dimensional object, and I'd have to like redo the whole thing. So by just saying this is it for better or for worse, this is going to be my darkest dark, this is going to be my lightest light, and then working within that range, I think was helpful. Yeah, a second year student, I mean, that's, gosh, you know, that you're very new to um, painting and drawing, and oftentimes it's just practice. I mean, it's obviously, it's way more than practice, but Absolutely. there's going to be so much that uh, you just start to understand over time. So that simple breaking down and uh, um, you know, simplifying it into drawing or black and white or all those things. Those are just ways of making it kind of palpable for the student to not freak out and uh, kind of give up, I guess. It's just, you break it into simple, simpler elements. And, but that's not to say that it couldn't be learned um, any other way. So as a student, you just have to I'll learn what your teacher is teaching you. And that's kind of why you're there, is to learn their process. Uh, don't expect more from your teacher than what they can actually do. If they can't paint, they're not gonna be able to teach you how to paint like the old masters. The limitation of, of what they can do is, is it's going to be seen in their artwork. So you just have to take what you get. Yeah. So Sonia asks um, the same person who asked about your palette, Michael. She uh -huh. says, what is the easel called? Uh, this is uh, a steel tripod easel. And I think, I don't know if it has a Brand, but if you go to like uh, Jerry's and look up steel tripod easel, you should be able to find it. It may be, uh, it's, it's made in Italy, but there's no like, there's no brand logo on it. 
but they're really handy because if you are out plein air painting and you want to do sight size, um, which I don't do, but if you wanted to, it comes in good for that because for tall people, it goes up really high. It goes up like well above. You can get a canvas like at six feet eye level, which a lot of yeah, you know, that's awesome. French these holes are even, um, I think depending on the tripod with edge, you can, you're, you're up pretty high, so it's should yep. be fine. That's entirely dependent on the, the tripod as well. But yeah, they're nice, they're like $75. That's pretty reasonable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have Felicity from New Zealand saying hello. All right. All right. Felicity. What time is it in New Zealand right now? That's a good question. Thanks for watching. Yeah, if there's any people tuning in from other uh, international locations, feel free to kind of chime in and let us know where you're viewing from. That's always a fun. You know, we do this for a lot of reasons, obviously, but mm -hmm. it, that's one of the fun things to, yep, to see where people are at. We do have uh, Timothy that is in Sweden, and it is at the time that he messaged us, it was around midnight. Okay. Wow. <laughs> that's late for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm one of those that starts... Um, Fading at about nine thirty and nine thirty or ten. So as soon as this is over, I'm gonna like crash. <laughs> but you also wake up at like four in the morning. Ooh, yeah, I wake up really <laughs> early. Sounds like that's TJ's favorite thing to do. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Felicity says it's one p.m. here. Very civilized time. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect time for viewing. That is better. the perfect time. Is anyone, I wonder if there's people painting along with us, if they like that kind of oh, part of it. Yeah, that's a good question. Also, uh, speaking of on that, please chime in and tell us if you all are painting along with us. If you don't know, just to kind of reiterate, uh, we have the reference photos on our website on eastoakstudio.com, and all you need to do is subscribe. Um, uh, there will be a subscription place right below on our website and um, just put your email in and it'll send you um, a link to be able to see all the reference photos from all of the past including this one um, painting from life's that we've done not all of them but the last four so the first you know, that the first couple <laughs> <laughs> Milu's from the Netherlands, and it's one in the morning. Oh, wow. And she says, great job, guys. Oh, and Felicity says, I might rewatch and paint along, but I can't miss a paint stroke right now. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> It really is. I mean, it's, when I was a student, this didn't exist. Like, no, yeah. You know, to be able to watch. I remember when I was a student, my first two schools, all I wanted to do was watch somebody do it. Yeah. Like, I was like, just show me, stop talking about it, and show me how to paint. Yeah. And, like, once a year, maybe we would get a demo. And I was never really satisfied with it. And then when I went to New York, uh, I got to see, uh, fortunately, it was a time period when Jacob Collins was teaching in his house, so I got to watch him put together exhibitions, and, and it, was, it was a great way of learning exactly what, what he was doing and kind of being able to absorb that. Because what you would, what you would realize is 
all the I, all the kind of preconceived notion that you know what I thought he was going to teach like, or what I thought he painted like, it was totally different. You know, mm -hmm. there was some stuff that was like that, like he would model through the form and he would do a block in, but at other times he would do a start very similar to this, where he's working all over the place, and then all of a sudden he would just like get super intense on the form. And it was you know a tiny little painting, a figure about the size of this panel. Mm. And seeing that, I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. The first time I, I didn't understand it, and it's just fascinating. So for those of you who are uh, joining here, um, you're just smart for taking advantage of it. I think you know you offer these things for free, and just you know, part of it's you know to be totally honest, that part of it's uh, sales and marketing. Obviously, you have to do stuff to keep things afloat in a business. But the other thing is that just to be generous and to create kind of an online community and share share what you do, and hope mm -hmm. that people kind of get inspired by it. Yeah. It's something that I think uh, it, I, I have found the, the uh, representational art world to be very, very generous. Mm. And I think, I think part of the reason is that there, there are no, I don't think there are any gimmicks or, you know, there's no way to, to steal someone's secret process. Yeah. It's a very straightforward way of thinking about art and um, everybody's on a different stage of the journey, obviously, but we're all really trying to push ourselves to the next level. So it's it's not the kind of trade where we're not threatened, like sharing everything right. we know, right? right. <laughs> because right. you can take everything we know, and you still you the way that you put it into practice is going to be very different than we put it into practice. So. Yep. Yeah, it's, it'd be like if I signed my name. You know, you would get a sense of kind of how I sign it, mm -hmm. but you're not going to copy it. Yep. Because there's so many different kind of variables about what goes into signing my name that way. Yeah. And so you can rewind it. You could watch it in slow mo, but it's just you can't you can't copy it unless you like. It's been a long time trying to <laughs> perfect that one kind of. But then my signature varies all the time. So then those slight variables are, it's very similar to brushwork and uh, you can't copy it. You can kind of understand it or appreciate it, but you can't copy it. It's really For the non-art professional here, I have a question. <laughs> TJ, were you just blending with the big brush a second ago? Yeah, just trying to soften some of my um, Soften some of my edges, so that's a. It's a it's a really slick panel, so it's not absorbent at all. Uh -huh. So it's not really setting up. So if I were to take a big bristle brush and go sort of scrub across that, it would just wipe it right off. Oh. So, um, I actually usually don't paint heads on uh, surfaces this. Uh, um, Shiny, uh, slick. So. Hmm. Yeah, TJ, thanks for doing this. This yeah. is a real like treat for people. Oh yeah. Well, thanks mm -hmm. for having me. Mm -hmm. I uh, I love I love painting. Uh, I love painting from life. I love painting faces. This is great. That's what it's all about, man. Overlapping. Yeah. What you want to do. Michael, how or why do you prefer short angled brushes? Yeah, that was something that uh, I got used to. Uh, it was actually, I stumbled into it by accident. Um, I ordered a, a bunch of brushes from Rosemary and Company for the Grand Central Atelier Still Life competition that um, I took part of in, in 2014, I think it was. It was a five-day competition where you um, you paint from life and they have, it's kind of like uh, Iron Chef where they have certain objects that you have to paint. You have to paint three or four of like this 
grab from the table and then you can bring in your own stuff. And so anyway, I accidentally ordered short brushes. And uh, honestly, it's, it's, it's a weird thing. I have long brushes too, but um, since that time, uh, I've used short handle brushes because then uh, Simi from Rosemary and Company offered to do a line of brushes and I did um, a set that were a short handle set because I really liked them. I liked the feel of it, it felt like a pencil in my hand. And, uh, and so it just became, I don't even, I, I often forget that I'm using short handle brushes and that's a unique thing. TJ, what type of panel are you using and do you prefer the slick surface? Mr. Drew wants to know. So the uh, it's just a piece of hardboard from uh, uh, you can get it at Lowe's or Home Depot or any uh, lumber supplies just uh, hardboard uh, brand name that people are familiar with is Masonite. Um, so it's, it's a really cheap surface that is, it's not, it's not like it's going to fall apart any year either. It's, it's fairly, it's a fairly decent surface. I do prefer to work on uh, ACM panel, aluminum composite panel, when I'm doing a more finished piece. But as far as the, the texture of the surface, I, I always say that I prefer whichever surface is going well. So if the painting's going well, I love the surface. <laughs> if the painting's not going well, I, I've got to blame it on something. So <laughs> I, I experiment quite a bit. I, I like some things about really absorbent surfaces and, um, and others about slick surfaces. So I just take a break. I'm kind of in flux there. I don't really have a favorite. I just um, kind of takes me a while to adjust to uh, how to paint on it. So we have people watching from Nova Scotia. And then Stand Dollar Studio says, I'm in Nova Scotia, quasi watching, mostly listening. I really enjoy you live. Um, I'm painting a still life Chianti, grapes, cheese, and nice setup. Oh man. Sounds mm -hmm. amazing. I know, sounds like a party. Yeah, that's interesting that um, he's listening to it. That's a, that's, you know, that's, that's great. I mean, uh, oftentimes when I see these videos and stuff, it, it would make sense to listen to it as well because. Mm. Uh, you want to be painting. It's hard to sit for three hours and, yeah. and just watch someone paint. So. Feel just free to ask look for at a lovely model. <laughs> if you want to, yeah, you can. You can oh my gosh, get up. I hope I can do Yeah. I'm not fussy. <laughs> Yeah, you could have a hundred people just in the room started to, the same uh, thing and it all be different. It just started to identify those greens. Yeah? Yeah, I'm just like, man, I gotta change this. It's starting to get a little too pink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is... I just need to put something on there. <laughs> it's like, it's starting have to look so too much like uh, a panel. Like, oil paints <laughs> yeah. or any... An artist studio or anything like that? No, just, yeah. I'll, I'll go, I'll, like, I'll look at like a museum or somewhere if I like travel or something, but... I'm not like in depth not to know what I'm really looking at, you know. Sure. Oh, that's yeah. nice. I like that. I got yeah. everything in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Karina says, Hi guys, I'm watching you from Bolivia. Oh. You really inspire me. Thanks for your YouTube channel. I watch awesome. all your videos, watch them every time I paint. That is awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. It's so much fun to hear all the people around the world because 
when we first started this, one, one of the things we really wanted to do is be able to say, how, how can we invest locally in the community around us that's in this town, but how can we also invest in people globally? Mm. And this is one of the ideas we came up with, of mm. being able to actually have um, a way to reach an audience with people around the world that might not be able to come to us. Mm. Um, so it's really special to be able to hear that there are people out there that are really enjoying it because that's been one of our hopes is to make sure that we can reach all those that we can't go to their locations to actually share and be a part of their community. So thank you for being a part of our online community. Carrie mm -hmm. asks, do you sometimes paint oils on acrylic gesso and do you ever find it hinders the light at all? It wouldn't, that would be fine. You just can't paint acrylic on oil. You can paint oil over acrylic. Right. The, uh, the uh, acrylic would just fall off the oil, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It dries quicker than that. When you uh, bind it to it right here, it would flake off. Yeah, it'd be like putting plaster on a balloon and then deflating the balloon or moving the balloon <laughs> around, and it would eventually just crack because. The oil keeps moving around. That's a good visual. Yeah. Like go. I was already not going to do it, but now I definitely won't. <laughs> Was that five minutes? Thirty seconds. So, no, we got thirty seconds. Yeah, take take two break. How's your neck? Your that angle's kind of. You have to sleep looking uh, to the left. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm just, I used to sleep. Yeah, on my right side. <laughs> Michelle asks, I'm just starting out figure drawing and painting. Do you have any general advice regarding how figure painting is different from still life, landscape, etc.? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's all super different, really. I mean, the, the common thing that holds it together is values and color when you're actually working with oil paints, but like when you're landscape painting outdoors, it's totally different than if you're landscape painting indoors. So in other words, the, the light is shifting like crazy. Uh, right now, this is a portrait session, our light is consistent. Uh, the model may fluctuate, you know, so every everything has its challenges. Um, just expect it to be all really difficult. Not to kind of put a damper on, but the reality of it is it's just difficult. So in this session, we ended up ordering another mic in order for all three of us to have uh, be mic'd up. And we found out that the mic didn't come with a particular receiver that it needed to have. So we ended up needing to do two. So we ended up having the two mics sort of held between the two of us. Um, position between us. Yeah. Exactly, so position, position between us. So for anyone out there who's um, it's a little bit tough to hear. The next live stream we do will most certainly have the proper amount of mics in order for everyone to have one, and the sound will be a bit, a bit less echoey. Yeah. So we appreciate y'all persevering through us as we have our technical difficulties. <laughs> it's always a little bit of a, it, it, to make it perfect, our last spot or location that we were in before was below an event space. Oh man, <laughs> brutal. And it was like there was a you know, group of zebras going across. The, I mean, it was just ridiculous because they would have weddings and it was, you know, it was pretty. Yeah, it was pretty rough. Pretty rough. So in this scenario, we have, um, like Lewis said, at the moment we're short of light, but it's not going to matter for. Our teaching live streams, our paid live streams, is just one person talking, so they're mic'd up, and it's it's good audio. But right now, it's it's creating a little bit of an echo because they're further away from us. Right. The mics. But bear with us; we'll get it figured out eventually. Will this video be available later on YouTube? Yeah. Yes, you can be able to watch it anytime. You won't be able to like ask questions, we're not going to still be there to answer them. But 
uh, you can watch the, the next one live if, um, if for some reason you're catching this as a recording. So Ben Valentine asks, I really like the transparent effect I see in paintings um, by Michael and Alex and others, especially in the darker areas and backgrounds, but I sometimes find I've gone too opaque and dark and it dry. Do you have a way to come back from this? Yeah, the great thing about oil painting is that you can do, I mean, you can, you can sand the painting and you can do a, a fresh uh, layer of thin paint, another dark. So if you ever look at like Paul Metabolism's work, you, you just kind of, you're mesmerized by how realistic it is, but you can't quite figure out the brush brushwork. Mm -hmm. It's just like, it's almost like, um, it's kind of too many layers to pin down. And that's just an idea of that at each stage of your painting, you know, people worry about how do you keep your painting fresh. And the oil paint is very forgiving. You can sand it, you can scrape it, you can go in and, and put in a fresh dark again and try not to put any opaque paint in that kind of uh, that glaze, essentially, because it's going to be over top of some underpainting. But uh, yeah, there's a lot you can do, just um, try to... Richard Schmidt would talk a lot about doing those um, color charts so that you could learn the, um, the character of each pigment. So some, some feel more opaque than others. And, uh, and so you get to know the character of the paints and what you can get away with to keep it transparent. That's good. And Michael, are you using thick oil color? Um, someone says your painting looks more, or like it has more viscosity and looks like impasto. Mm. Part of that may be the ground. Uh, I have pretty um, rough ground. Um, but at the same time, I also am applying in, in sections and applying more paint. Uh, but it's probably due to some of the ground that's coming through. And do you ever scrape out parts of a painting? Yes. My goal in a painting is I don't, I don't want the viewer to be able to understand all the process. I want there to be a sense of mystery in the technical process. And that usually happens anyway. It's very rare that you can just look at something and understand how it's done. But if you make it intentional to confuse people, then it's even harder. So oftentimes in my flower painting, I'll do a really loose block in like this and I'll leave it. And then intentionally so that I can glaze over sections and scrape it and sand it and do it again. And just create so many layers that uh, you wouldn't be able to fully understand. Sometimes I start with a dark background, then I go and put a light background on top of that and glaze over it, so you have three layers there. Yep. Um, so. At what point in your career would you say you started doing that sort of thing? Like That's a good question. Um, so, I studied for seven years, so I went through three schools, and then as soon as I got out, I had, between 2005 and 2008 is when I did my first show. So there's a period where I had to paint and just kind of play it safe and do what I had learned in school, but even then I, I started to experiment. So one thing that I didn't do is I didn't change my palette. Uh, and I tried to stick to the same thing for each painting. So I would do a drawing, I would grid it out, transfer it, and then paint it. Uh, blow it up on the big canvas and paint it. Um, but even then, I was already experimenting with like different layers. So as soon as I got out of school, I started to experiment. In school, it was mainly like one, one layer. You try to paint as best you could in one shot. It wasn't really, it was kind of frowned upon to do two layers. 
Uh -huh. And so um, when I got out, then I was I, I just started implementing. Like I, I the goal was to do it in like three layers. So I'd do a block in, I'd do another pass, and then the final pass would be like before it goes to the gallery, I'd fix it and make all these little edge corrections. Now were you doing still lives or figure uh, in figure and still life. And with the still life painting, how would you how would you pull off taking that much time? You would do that all while the flowers were still alive or well at that time I was doing one flower a day. So I would block in the background and I would slowly paint one flower each day. Okay. So it's been like six hours of one flower. Which is totally different than how I do it now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Walt Walt asks, how long do you wait to sand and glaze between layers of a painting? Uh, depends on what you, how thin you painted it, or at least a day. Um, unless you're, you're working and you don't like it, then you can scrape it with a palette knife. And Sergeant did that all the time, from what the records say. Mm -hmm. Put something down, scrape it, put something down, scrape it. So you can either choose to let it dry and scrape it and sand it, or you can just scrape it as it's wet. It, 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 it really doesn't matter. It depends on what effect you're going for. Wild Browser asks, is transparency a comparative relationship in a painting like values are, or is it simply opaque or transparent? I, I personally think it's uh, comparative. Uh, because you can, it, I think there's like multiple sort of sliders in painting. There's edges, you know, and you can have like a hierarchy of edges, of really sharp edges all the way to very, very soft edges. You can have a hierarchy of very opaque all the way to very transparent. And you can have a hierarchy of chromatic all the way to very less chromatic. And then you can have a hierarchy of value the brightest thing first all the way down and you use those to create and you can I mean you can do a hierarchy of brushwork even where you're to in sort of a technical narrative of like different types of brushwork that created its own nomenclature for you to be able to understand your eye to be able to understand what each thing is representing and meaning and it's how you use those so I mean, that's the long answer <laughs> for, for a short question, but um, so yes, I definitely think that you can use it to your advantage of creating a spectrum of thick to, thick to thin. What would you say, TJ? Uh, yeah, I would say that I think what Lewis just said. <laughs> 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 this is, everything, everything in a in a painting is a relationship so it's just how whatever you're doing relates to the rest it, it, everything within a painting is defined by the rest of the painting I would say um, so with uh, um, sometimes when I'm painting I'll actually take uh, a tube of paint and squeeze the particularly white. I'll I'll squeeze the paint right onto the the panel and mix all the colors and shifts on the panel so that all of the paint goes on my uh, my painting. And so, in in that sort of situation, that's really 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 thick paint, and everything starts to look kind of thin in comparison. But something like what I'm doing right now, um, all of it's pretty thin. So. How many years of painting did it take for you to feel satisfied with the quality of the paintings you produced? I've been painting three years, and it's still rare that I'm happy with my paintings. I've been painting ten years, and it's still rare that I'm happy with my paintings. <laughs> um, we, we produced a documentary not too long ago of Jeff, Jeffrey T. Larson, and in it he says where you want to be, and where you are, and where you want to be 
you never really get there. Um, so I think that if you ever felt satisfied, you almost kind of wonder if you're starting to like plateau on your ability to learn, <laughs> you know. Um, I, I think that all of us have a hunger to get to the next level. And because of that, um, I think that there there is a level of satisfaction and I think there's a level of, of being dissatisfied. And I think you have to kind of like walk that tightrope because it's the satisfaction that actually motivates you to want to keep doing it and not get completely depressed. <laughs> and then there's the dissatisfaction that helps motivate you to keep wanting to see that there's more to learn. So that, that kind of leads us to the next question, which is from Sharon in Alaska. And she says, thanks for this. When do you make the decision to keep pushing through a painting you don't feel good about and or starting over? Michael? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Better. I encourage people on workshops just to try to push through it. Um, that was something in school, in, in, in my studies, that uh, Jacob would really stress to the students to just keep pushing through it and keep trying to... Because uh, a lot of times it's, it's going to get better. You just have to not be defeated along the way. Like if you, if you defeat yourself or, or get so hard on yourself that you, you start over, what I tell people is chances are you didn't, you didn't add any new information in your kind of knowledge base from the, the time you started to the time you're starting over. It's not like you went and studied form mm -hmm. and you're like, okay, now I understand form, I'm gonna start over. Yep. You're just starting over emotionally. So you're not adding any new information, any new technical like revelation. So chances are you're gonna do the exact same errors. Mm. So why start over? Just try to let it dry and fix it. What do you think? Is that yeah. fair? There's also a, a, a thinking in, uh, I don't know, some schools of painting that you kind of have to, you have to get it right from the beginning or it just won't turn out the way that you want it to be. And I, you know, I think that's, there's some truth to that, but I, I decided a while ago to just take that pressure off myself. So I'm, you know, I'll, I'll work on a painting, you know, uh, a long time. And, uh, so, um, you'll hear, you'll hear people say, don't, you know, there's a lot of concern that people have that they'll overwork their paintings. So it's like, man, I've been working on it a lot and it's starting to look overworked. Um, when, when a painting starts feeling like overworked, I think that probably means that the colors are starting to get similar or you're starting to get too many small shapes and not enough of the large shapes to resolve, but you can just simplify it. Mm -hmm. You can take a brush and mm -hmm. simplify it. Yep. And there it is. And you're back to, um, so for me, there isn't really that, that magic in painting where you kind of have to listen to the painting. Maybe that's something that'll come a long time from now. I don't know, but I just, I keep going until I like it. I don't, I don't really ever start over. Uh, I think it's, it was like Nelson Shanks who said that, um, a paint, there's never a painting that's ever worked. It's only, um, you only have given up or something like that where it's talking about you just didn't take it through the bad stages. Sure, yeah. <laughs> you know? Anyone that was off and on my easel recently for, was actually uh, used it in one of the ads for this. It was the, uh, the snowy, the snowy one with the mountains mm -hmm. in the distance, yeah, Twilight, yeah. Mm -hmm. and I like struggled with that thing for the almost the entire year. It's a great thing. Thank you. Yeah, and actually did learn uh, to your point, Michael. Like um, it was not starting over; it was sticking with it that I finally did figure out the the technical things that were keeping me from getting the finish that I wanted. So. 
I actually finished it and signed it and then decided I didn't like it and painted over it. Really? And I didn't like that and then I painted over it again. So there's a lot of paint. That's awesome. <laughs> there's a lot of paint on that one. I have a hard time giving up on a painting. You know, um, I hear, you know, Michael and Alex can kind of like stop painting on a painting because they're like, yeah, I don't, I don't, don't like the direction it's going and I'm, I think I'm gonna go to the next name. I have a really difficult time um, losing the investment that I've already put into it. Um, there's, a, there's a thing in economics called the sunk cost fallacy, mm -hmm. which is, talks about the amount that you invested in it, if you're still gonna lose, is still not gonna help you to continue to try to regain if the possibility is, mm -hmm. of loss is still great. And, um, and so a lot of people look at their, the, all the time they've invested in something that might just never come to fruition. Return. And yeah, and they might never get a return on it, but they're like, but I've already put this much time into it. And so sometimes I find myself going, hmm, is this a sunk cost fallacy situation? <laughs> you know. I admire people that can do it. I, I have I just have a tough time. I will stop painting on something and look at it for 10 years and go, well, it's still not done yet. <laughs> but, <laughs> That's funny. We do have some paintings like that. Something that... Uh, I... Uh, thinking of the sort of... the, the Michelangelo's and Rem, Rembrandt's and the great masters of our day are in the movie making business where they have these mm -hmm. multi-million dollar projects that are perfectly assembled and reach an enormous audience and they're super famous and so I think of um, Christopher Nolan um, directing Dunkirk and just all the little pieces of this there are no I mean there probably maybe there are a couple I don't know enough about the movie industry to know but there aren't very many accidents. Like, it was intentional mm -hmm. all the way through. And that was sort of a, you know, a, a revelation to me that, um, you know, they didn't just walk out onto a beach with their cameras and their actors and be like, okay, you go over there, we'll see right. how it looks, yeah. you know. Um, so I'm trying to do more uh, work ahead of the finished piece. Um, just to help. More planning. More planning, mm -hmm. more planning. And I think that's something that the artists that I really admire um, <laughs> do well. Here. <laughs> Too cozy. It is kind of cool down here, huh? I mean, up here, in the tower. <laughs> <laughs> like done. <laughs> I love it. I'm like, well, I'm actually just got paint on my canvas now. I can push it around a little bit. <laughs> and I have to force myself to work here because I'm committed to it. <laughs> So we're going to go to nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You okay with that? Sure am. Yeah, man. Yeah. Nine is good. Just 
trying to gauge my uh, the the landing here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's like, what can I do? I right. <laughs> what can I do to? And surely we haven't already spent over half our time. <laughs> sure. It can't have been, right? Right. It's only been like twenty minutes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, somebody asked if we're using lead white or titanium white. I'm using titanium white. Um, I am using actually a mixture of lead white and titanium white. I typically will do a little bit of both when I'm doing like Ala Prima paintings and stuff. Because uh, the lead white kind of gets a bit heavy and thick and so the titanium actually cuts that a little bit. Um, but I also like some of the properties of lead white. so. That's why I'll kind of mix them. And it makes the paint less expensive because lead white can get expensive. <laughs> some more questions. Um, are you guys using lead white or titanium white? I just asked that one. Oh, you Sorry. did? Okay. Yeah. Taking students on tomorrow at 10 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was just... that's what the company is about. So if they're not familiar with the the website, they may be. I don't know if they could be watching it. It's not because it's it's on YouTube live. You oh yeah, right. YouTube. Yeah, YouTube. Um, so just visit eastoaksstudio.com, and we have. Lots of tutorials that are uh, workshop format. <laughs> ben Valentine asks, do you guys have any bananas to tape to your paintings? Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I, did you see that there's a guy, a performance artist, that ate it? Oh, really? Yeah. Is it all right? The guy bought the, the, the banana, and then the, that later that day he ate it. Oh, he bought it and then ate it. No, the no poor performance artist. I don't know. It wasn't the guy who bought it. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm assuming he had the permission from the guy Perform who bought the it. The performance <laughs> artist snuck into his house and ate his banana. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question. Um, Jeff asked, "Have you ever taken students on a workshop?" Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
That's they awesome. live in a dream in Australia. That is awesome. And this is my boy. He'll be painting and I'll come over and bug him. <laughs> Make sure he doesn't paint as fast as he paints. <laughs> Do you guys use alizarin crimson or alizarin. substitute? What? Alizarin. Alizarin? Mm -hmm. uh, it's an art professional. I actually took it off my palate for this thing. I, I, I'm starting to think that I don't need it because I have magenta and burnt sienna. Oh. So I took it off. I do use it. Um, I also use it. Um, it comes in handy uh, with a couple of the mixtures that I like that I think create some really beautiful warms, neutral warms. When the painting is complete, how do you store for drying before varnishing? I have heard many artists flip paintings to help eliminate dust from collecting on surfaces. Your thoughts? Um, well, dust can be a problem. Um, you can flip it over for sure, and that'll help. Uh, I, I typically, I just, I, I actually don't do too much with, with my painting. I just let it dry. But I also do sometimes have dust issues, so maybe I should find a better practice. I only uh, do that when I varnish it. So I'll let it rest face up for a little while, and then when the varnish is not going to run, I'll, I'll lean it against the wall so that the top edge is just barely touching. I don't, I don't have pets, and that's another reason not to have pets, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that's your excuse when um, in your family, your kids okay. ask you, hey, can we have pets, Dad? Yeah, right. No, no, the paintings, paintings. <laughs> I, don't, I don't give hard nose to questions like that. I just try to kick it downfield as far <laughs> as I can. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll think about subject. it. <laughs> yeah. That's an interesting idea. I'll talk to Mom. Go to sleep. Yeah, exactly. The sad thing is, I always hear the kids have great memories about those kinds of things, and they will not forget, and they'll bring it up. Hey, Dad, did you ever talk to Mom? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so someone's asking, I'm going to butcher this poor person's name at the very end. How would you describe the technical difference or similarity in how Jeremy Lifking achieves naturalistic flush versus how Serge Marshenikoff? Does? Sergey? Uh-huh. Sergey? Oh, gosh. Uh, hmm. No clue. I, I don't know how to answer that one. Are we talking about their colors that they're using, or their brushwork, or both? I think a little bit of both. Well, their, bre their, their, their brushwork is, is definitely different. I think that... Um, Sergey models through the form, and Jeremy right. paints all over the place. Uh, uh, and and the edges are you know different. Jeremy tends to use much larger and wider brushes, and Sergey mm -hmm. actually uses very small, small. thin brushes. Mm -hmm. And um, and um, I mean, some of that's speculation, right? Because I don't know. I haven't seen Sergey's brush. I mean, but oh, absolutely. This is only from observation. Yeah. I, I'm not saying this is exactly true. Um, I'm just trying to like guess from what I've seen of his work. Because mm -hmm. like Rachel Parsonet uses small brushes and I've had. Oh but yeah, I never that's, thought she used. that's so true. So Carrie wants to know, could you summarize the mission or goal of East Oaks again? When did it form and has the path changed as you've moved along? you all stay there year-round, or move around teaching, etc. Michael? Uh, gosh. Um, so, at the very beginning of the Kickstarter, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but we had kind of a, a, 
a phrase that was spreading all through beauty. Mm-hmm. And so the idea is to provide content uh, that would inspire and create an atmosphere for people to plug into that would also be inspiring for professional artists and um, students, etc. So that idea of like being local and, and global and it's it's taken different uh, kind of formations, but that's still the essence of um, what we're doing, uh, what we want to try to provide for people. Um, it's really about just kind of doing something uh, from your heart that kind of can resonate with people. And it's never perfect. And it'll always be kind of flawed. You know, people criticize it because it's this or that. And in the end, you just have to tune all that out and just kind of have fun. And, you know, we get to hang out. I'm, I'm living in Massachusetts now. I get to come back to North Carolina, hang out, and be at the house. So it's just, it's really to be able to do that and then overlap it with this. And, and can you explain what you're doing in Massachusetts? Uh, so I'm part of a, a new project that's um, I'm working with family in Massachusetts to found um, a museum dedicated to drawing, painting, and sculpture done in the last 50 years, uh, specializing in, in realist art. So um, I'm living up there full time and um, helping out with the direction of it and overseeing and kind of just the connection to the artist, essentially. Why don't you guys talk about some of the artists that are going to be coming in addition to the awesome TJ Cunningham this weekend? Who do we have lined up for the next several sessions? Nice. Um, well, we have we have a lot of people we're talking to, and we actually have a, a pretty full schedule for this next year. Um, but for the most part, a lot of them are st- we're still getting all of the actual documents signed. Um, so not until all of it's signed and like. Re- fully ready to go, I don't want to necessarily um, speak too quickly um, mm-hmm. so that I get, get our audience hopes up. But if you shared their names, they would all know. They, uh, they yes, would they would know. know who they were. <laughs> 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 um, but we are pretty excited about this, this next year's um, lineup. And, um, you know, we have some really... Uh, great seasoned painters but we also are always trying to find who we feel like are young artists that have new artists that have stuff to contribute that we think uh, we believe in and we're going to have several of those as well Um, so it'll be it'll be exciting it's basically one one live stream workshop a month right kind of yes kind of our, our schedule yep as far as um, artists go for inspiration in your field of work? Uh, so uh, my favorite, like the top, I'd say the top five landscape painters for me, um, in the, the order changes day to day, but uh, T. Allen Lawson, Clyde Astavig, uh, George Carlson, Oh, and a couple others. <laughs> Didn't quite make it to five. I can never see them if people ask them. Like, I, okay. I don't know. There are more. There are more. <laughs> uh, Joseph McGurl. I love his, uh, his landscapes. Um, and I'm leaving out a couple that I... But uh, those that get people started. Mm. So... That's great group. Um, I also... So those are... Those are more... I'd say probably 20 or 30 years, depending. George Carlson, I think, is um, 
probably in his 70s. So they're all, they have very, very well-developed careers, those artists that I just named. And then some, some newer painters that, um, that I'd love to follow on Instagram are uh, David Dibble, who's a wonderful landscape painter, and Josh Clare. And then a whole bunch of Russians whose names I will not <laughs> attempt to pronounce. But if they're Russian and they're painting the landscape, usually I like them. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're good. No Bob Ross? You know, I never got into Bob <laughs> Ross. I, I, I just, I missed the boat on Bob Ross. So that's probably one of the, one of my handicaps. I should circle back to Bob Ross. He's on Netflix now. Oh, we watched one of the <laughs> Netflix videos of Bob Ross painting. Oh, uh, was it good? I was doing research, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. It was fun. It, it, was, it was, fun. was nostalgic. It was nostalgic. Yeah, because I, I grew up watching Bob. It, it was my era for sure. <laughs> See, that's that's the thing. If if I if you don't have nostalgia, I think it might be hard to make it through. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> but anyway. Grew up with Bob, definitely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I had a studio in my parents' garage when I was like eight doing Bob Ross paintings. That's awesome. Oh, really? it up, yeah. So you were a landscape painter long Yeah, I started out as a landscape artist, yeah. I didn't know. <laughs> it's funny because um, I most certainly did that too. And I never had the right colors. And it's like, <laughs> Grandma, you're supposed to give me the right colors for my birthday. You gave me green and green and brown. <laughs> the magic white was pretty crazy, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the I liquid made, white. The magic white. Oh, you called it magic white? It's magic, yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm I, thought, I, thought sure it was, I thought it was liquid white. white. Well, maybe. Let me look it up. The all-powerful Google. That, like, when, that he had, like, primed his canvas with? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe they like rebranded it to Magic White later or something. You know, it's wasn't paying attention. Because <laughs> the one we were like watching was it liquid? I, I don't know. Let's see. Bob Ross. <laughs> magic. Magic White and Magic Black. I think. No. Uh, liquid. It was liquid. Uh. Well, I don't know. It's showing up as. We'll get to the bottom of this. <laughs> this is important. It is important. <laughs> I believe it's liquid. Liquid light. Yes. Yes. They, I think they, don't they like pause temporarily for like a series of time from, from live to when it's like fully available just to kind of uh, like, like a half, I think like a half hour after you should be able to watch something. Did you set the time right Yeah. Yes. We got three and a half minutes. What's actually the hardest thing for you guys talking about painting? Uh, like to um, talking and painting, or just talking about? I don't know. Trying What's to actually the hardest thing for you guys? Comma talking about painting? Question mark. Mm. Oh, yeah, like talk, keep it yeah. to painting, no? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping up my lawn. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Laundry is always a tough thing. <laughs> Michael, when learning to paint flowers, did you focus on specific flowers to get a better understanding of specific flower types, or were you mm -hmm. less premeditated than that? At the beginning, I did a lot of uh, white roses, actually. And the reason for it was because the forms were bigger on the petals. And uh, 
I, it was a much safer um, aesthetic for me. So I was very concerned with um, coming across basically as a floral painter. <laughs> I mean, even early on, uh, I didn't want to be viewed as any lesser for painting flowers. Uh, so I'd keep them like dark backgrounds, white flowers. It was very safe. Mm. And then I don't know when like all the pinks and all that crap came into the picture. But I think it was the Chelsea. <laughs> all that crap. When I, I was by the Chelsea flower market and I just kept buying flowers. And and I liked pushing the color. Um, and it happened to be that reds and pinks were pretty consistent. Mm. And so I painted it. And, um, yeah, I guess I kind of just, at a certain point in my life, I stopped worrying about what people were thinking so much and just kind of painted it for the sake of, because it was beautiful. Realism artists achieve abstraction and mystery in a painting aside from brushwork like sanding and scraping. Mystery. Uh, I mean, uh, sometimes, I mean, I don't know if this actually sounds obvious or if I'm just or not, but I, I always think that part of the sense of mystery that you can create in painting is when you say less about the painting than more and keep things more abbreviated that, that um, allow for the viewer to be able to fill in the blank. Um, I sometimes feel like that helps create a particular sense of mystery in your work, but I also think that um, I remember Jacob telling me something about when we were talking about shadows and keeping shadows thin and, and kind of separating even the texture of the shadows from what is in the light so that there is this sort of sense of mystery of what's going on in the shadow and make things very subtle and then in the light state things um, very clearly and it allows for there to be sort of that tension between the two. It's good. Mm -hmm. waiting this whole time, Michael, for you to tell me that I have a good answer. <laughs> well, our audience thinks it's good. They're, for sure. So now that you guys have some layers down, does this mean to have a lighter touch in order not to disturb what's underneath? Do you make your paint more fluid at all? It definitely means on mine I do, at least. I'm starting to use oleo gel. So at the beginning I was using Gamsol, and now I'm using oleo gel. And, I'm, and I am being very gentle with my <laughs> surface. So I would, uh, would come right up if I pushed too hard. Cabrina is a very delicate person right now in our paintings. <laughs> Fragile. <laughs> so fragile. <laughs> so Seth Tummins says, really looking forward to watching the recordings of Mr. Cunningham's work. Have to work during the broadcast, but very grateful to East Oak Studios for having him. Great. I'm grateful for Seth. Thank <laughs> you, Seth. <laughs> Be sure to uh, email in a question for TJ if you're not live. Maybe we can get to it the next day. Yeah. That'd be a good idea. Because once the broadcast is over, then we can't get to any other questions. So if you miss it, at least you can email a question and we'll try to address it. 
if it wasn't already addressed. Mm -hmm. Keeping up on it slowly but surely. Slowly but surely. Carrie asks, are you laying off edges with the one brush? Do you leave no edges or ridges? Question mark, or do you just or do you just don't want them in certain areas? That's for TJ. That's directed towards TJ. Uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, I, I don't want the. If you put a brush stroke on, it often leaves track marks, and depending on the angle of your brush stroke, you'll get false highlights. So just uh, especially with faces. I'm, I'm usually using a big soft brush to try to knock out those false highlights. Mm -hmm. And and also, again, the, just the, the way that this painting has gone for me, this paint film is very delicate. And so I'm not, uh, so I'm trying to soften some edges without actually removing the paint. And so I'm doing that with a big soft brush. It's actually not the way that I usually paint, so um, it's the way that it's gone this time. So you're keeping <laughs> your secret no, technique. Huh? Hidden. You're sharing the, you're throwing a, a fake in there. Yeah, right. See, yeah. I hear you. I see what's going on. You know, I can copy you. Could do your mm -hmm. public demo, and then you have your secret painting technique. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> see, I see how you do. That's the thing with head studies. They are like they can because there isn't any pressure oh, yeah. on me to make this something that will sell so I don't really have the same sort of um, demand for consistency or you know I can kind of this one can go down in flames not that I want that to happen <laughs> yep and I'll be okay and so that's that's one thing about um, that's one thing I think about doing studies like this um, it's really so I think that was a question earlier why as a landscape painter do you paint heads um, so practice drawing is one and then just the ability to sort of play around is another um, I definitely love doing these painting from life because every time I am actually experimenting with things that I typically wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I find it as a great opportunity to try stuff and not be scared of that, you know. I, I try to be the same way with my plein air sketches. Where I just, there's no, um, there's a painter named John Paul that I spent a little bit of time with. And um, before that, I, I really loved, um, so Olive Prima was sort of how I came to this style of art. Um, and uh, so that's Richard Schmidt's book. And I, 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 I think I, I misunderstood a little bit, you know, how how he built his career and, and uh, what it takes for him to finish a painting, but there is that sort of idea in that school of painting that's sort of like a sketch and you only do a few brush strokes and it's done. And so there was, I, I had a lot of pressure on my sketches to be uh, really precise and, and, you know, 
something that eventually I would be able to sell for twenty thousand dollars or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so John Ball, when I started painting with him a little bit, I would say, "Oh, that's really, really beautiful. It's such a wonderful painting." He said he would just sort of shrug in the same way each time, like, "It's just a sketch." Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, "It's just a sketch." <laughs> And uh, so working with him a little bit, I, I took all the pressure off things like this and most of the time with plein air painting. Um, and I think I have been able to learn more from them than I was before. Yeah, that's awesome. So our good friend Carmen Gordon just chimed in. She says, Yay. beautiful model, love all the paintings, looking forward to watching TJ at work, hugs to all. Oh. Sweet, sweet lady. We love Carmen. She's mm -hmm. one of our local friends here that is an incredible painter in her own right. Very talented. That's great. Well, it's an honor to have her watch. <laughs> Absolutely. Lucas asks, is it necessary to go to an art academy to be a professional artist? I did not go to an art academy. There you go. And definitely not. Not necessary. I would even almost say, if you <laughs> can avoid it, then you will avoid the student loan debt that you will be smacked with. Yeah, student loan stuff is pretty tough. <laughs> that is uh, that is actually really, really, really good advice. That uh, if you want to paint after you study, um, workshops and YouTube and things like East Oaks are a good way to learn a lot for, like, depending on where you would want to study, like, hundred thousand dollars less. Yeah. Because in the end, I wonder what the ratio is for people who go to those universities and actually sell any paintings. Usually they end up making their money back from teaching. Mm, yep. From like universities for sure, because people are banking on getting their masters and then mm. getting a job at a major university. For sure. TJ, is the majority of your completed work um, commission-based, or do you just do what you enjoy and then put it in galleries? Yeah, so I, I just do what I enjoy and put it in galleries. And so the, the, the pressure, uh, there's, it's sort of a, it's a different pressure than with uh, with the commission because you're still I mean I don't know I'm sure there's some artists who don't don't do this at all but you're still you're aware that somebody's going to look at this and they have to like it you know so I you know I, I paint some with a mind toward you know the this this sort of subject matter is popular or you know this there's just when you're when you're when you're painting for a living, there's always you're just aware of the collector, right? So it's not like I just I paint whatever and I have a blast and then I put it in a frame and send it to a gallery and case or mm -hmm. So there's a little you know there's always that sort of um, I'm always aware of my audience, but it's not like a commission where. Your, your client can actually tell you, yes, I do like it, no, I don't. Yeah. Um, please change this. So it's, it's just a much fuzzier sort of uh, um, thing. But it's really rewarding because, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times people who hadn't even heard of me before will, will buy my paintings when they see them in galleries. So that's... That's just a really, that's an exciting uh, validation of, of what I'm doing. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Really 
really starting to develop a likeness. That's good. <laughs> I, um, it's always one of those things where I wish I had another X amount of hours. Brandon's an excellent model. She is. She's oh, just killing it. Oh, so good. I mean, just a statue. You ever want to come back? Just let us know. Yeah, we'd love that. You really did a great job. It's amazing what one little dab of paint does as far as perceiving angulation of her nose, just from that one little white spot that you put on her nose. Oh yeah, the highlights? Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, I try to hold off on those until the end, sort of building up to them. There are differing opinions on that. I think David David LaFell was was watching him and he was saying it's a really important relationship. You should just put the highlight in right away. Mm. But I can't my, my teacher in college taught me not to do that and I just haven't I can't bring myself to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well it seems like it's working for you, so yeah. How about you two? Do you have highlight rules? Um, I've kind of gone back and forth. I kind of like holding off and putting the highlight later because it's kind of a magical moment, I believe. Yeah. Um, especially if I'm doing it in the eye. Like, I'll do the whole eye and then, like, especially if I'm doing a demo, then doing that last little glint. Everybody's like, oh. You're like, wait, wait. <laughs> yeah, wait it's for coming. it. And then you go, <laughs> and everybody's like, oh. Yeah. You know, but, um, you know, pay no t attention to the likeness. <laughs> Just look at the glint in the eye. <laughs> but um, I, I find that it's sometimes helpful to, to know kind of where your the direction of your light source is, knowing where the specular reflection is and all that stuff. So that part is helpful. I would, I would hold off on it. That's, it just doesn't makes sense to put something like that which exists on the surface of the form anyway so you're not even talking about structure or anatomy and all that stuff the highlight you know is separate from the form light so i think it's you can definitely wait so mitchell scott asks do you artists have any thoughts on the monetizing potential between landscape and portrait paintings? Like which is better? Who makes more money? I think that's what he said. Brawl in here. Dun dun dun. You do whatever you, you like. So yeah, I, I wanted to be a portrait painter, or I thought I did when I first began my career. And I, I think I just, I think I always was more of a, a landscape painter type. And I just loved um, Sargent and Zorn and those painters so much, I thought that I wanted to paint the portrait. And uh, I think that I kind of came to it that I just really liked those artists, but I don't particularly want to paint portrait. So I really, I really enjoy being outside. I really enjoy um, the sort of exploring the uh, feelings of a scene, you know, because they, you know, different the places make you feel something, you know, you just have an emotional reaction to the landscape. And uh, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade right now anyway, I wouldn't trade that for portraiture. 
even if there was a lot of money to be made. I think. <laughs> Send in the big commissions, right. people. <laughs> Test me. <laughs> no, I, I think Michael nailed it. You know, we we're we're already we're not in this profession for the money. <laughs> None of us are, because this is not one of the like big money making professions. If you want to go do that, be you know, doctor in finance or something. What, what we do this for is, is because we're passionate about um, the love of, of art making and, and craftsmanship and, and you know typically subject matter. Something that we paint is what inspires us, what we connect with that's truthful to us. And because of all of that, I think that um, you, should, you should be really considering what kind of world you want to paint and what do you think is worth representing um, and then latch on to that because if you're painting something true to you uh, it, it's it's much more magnetic to your audience it just comes through so um, I don't know I think that's I think you'll always paint a better painting if you're painting what you love not what you want to sell Mm. Yeah, I mean, with portraits particularly, you can. The the thing is that you you get paid before you do it. In landscapes, you can actually sell a lot. Uh, for like, if you do, there's you know, there's a whole. We talked about this a lot in in when I was in school. There's a whole group of artists that sell paintings for three hundred fifty dollars mm -hmm. a pop, and they can make like two a day. And so, if you get a really good following, and you sell either one painting for eight hundred dollars or two paintings for seven hundred dollars or whatever a day, you know you can make more than actually some of the artists who are hanging for like half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. because they never sell those things. It's kind of like more of, they, they sit in the gallery. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to find a buyer at half a million dollars. But meanwhile, you have the artist who's painting every day selling for 500 bucks a pop mm -hmm. with no representation, cash mm -hmm. in. And it's kind of, it's just, it's hard to really know unless you can see people's taxes. And then even then, you don't know if they have support. You know, like the hardest thing about f trying to figure out painters and how to survive is, oftentimes the really successful people you think are successful is they have some other source of income. Mm. And so it's it's really hard to get a gauge of of what's actually what's happening is, you know, who's who's actually selling and who's. And there are ways you can figure it out if you get to know the artist and you get to, you know, you can see some examples, but oftentimes you don't know where people are getting their money from. So it's just, it's kind of deceiving. You could, and, and social media is horrendous for deception. You know, it's, you just don't know. Yeah. Mitchell says, thanks, that really resonated. I have a feeling the landscape has greater, greater potential in the monetary sense, but I personally get more satisfaction out of my portraits versus landscapes. Great. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I will say this, I'm a portrait painter, and I've been, I've been blessed to make it a full living, make a full living from it. And I do it because I love it. And I love, I love trying to I love the honor of being able to record humanity and um, try to do it in a unique way. And um, that's why I do it. And it just happens to that. It also has done, is it's done well for me financially as far as just being able to make a living and putting food on the table. Um, so it's allowed me to keep, continue doing it. So 
So Ben has a question. Um, he says, party pooper question. Do you guys ever face depression or at least something like having a fever painting in the studio alone so much? I, I, I can be totally sincere and honest, and you can ask my wife. I, I, it, almost to the point of where I'm starting to question, <laughs> I get seriously depressed um, because oftentimes the thing that is the right thing is so difficult to um, uh, transcend it properly, I guess, or to, to the, the, there's so much deception in the market that um, it, it can get pretty overwhelming. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm involved in some really exciting stuff too, you know, so it's not, I don't think you're ever, depending on the kind of personality you are, you're never um, completely free of it. So. Lewis and I were talking earlier and uh, when I first graduated from college, I, you know, when you're when you're painting in school, you're surrounded by other painters, so it's a very it's a very social thing. Mm. And then you know you critique each other's paintings, and uh, there's just sort of that other person in the room almost all the time. And so then when I graduated from college and launched my career, uh, I felt like uh, if you've seen the movie Gravity where the George Clooney character gets sort of shot out into outer space and he's just drifting and he's going to die in outer space <laughs> alone <laughs> drifting and that's how I felt it was, the, it was one of the lowest I've ever you know I've just I was I was wretched for quite a while and I just I don't know what happened but I just kind of uh, Made a made a peace with the fact that it was going to be a solitary kind of lonely job, and it was worth it. And um, and now it doesn't really bother me to be alone, um, not like it did. So it's uh, it's one of those things where if you give it enough time, or at least in my case, the the career is kind of shaping me. Um, I, I think that that question is an excellent question, by the way. I, um, it's probably been one of my favorite um, so far, just as far as like an interesting question, because, you know, it, it, it's an honest, it's an honest thought. And I think all artists, you know, you have to find what helps you, I, I think, I think it was um, Jacob also that said one time something to the point of, if you don't feel like you're going to have like a complete nervous breakdown and frustration, you're not like, like a, a real, you're not really you're trying not to pursue right. something all <laughs> right, you know, <laughs> and, and, um, and so there is a lot of sort of agony in the ecstasy and there's, there's a balance between the two. For me, it's, it's, it was very similar. I'm an extreme extrovert. And I had to find ways to help bring a, an, a community around me in order for it. Because as an extrovert, I have picked a very lonely <laughs> occupation. And so, uh, or occupation of solitude, I guess you could say. And so by actually creating, having artists and, and colleagues around who are passionate about it with, with you has really helped that matter because there's most certainly times that I felt like I was an island and the only person painting and um, you know trying to figure out what I needed to do in order to um, make it all work honestly so um, and I'm and I'm one of the more happy people you've ever met that is pretty optimistic and and if it, if it can get me down at times and that's pretty that's saying something <laughs> so um, so no, it'll it, it'll be all right. Just find the ways that help you. Um, if this is something that you're struggling with too, which I think almost all artists do, I think you find find the ways that actually 
uh, create joy in, in your vocation and occupation and do the things that allow that to, you know, manipulate your career in a way that allows for you to be able to do that. And do you feel like, I don't know, connecting with people in your own community, that's yes, helpful? Yes, absolutely. If you uh, find other artists or other like-minded people that are doing something similar to you, is helpful, especially if you're a person that enjoys that kind of thing. I think some people, you know, thrive in having their time to be able to recharge and be away from people, and then there's others that are like me that need that those people around. Um, so I think you also kind of have to listen to you. Mm. All right, this is the this is the last session. Is it? Yep. Oh gosh. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> you got, you got <laughs> two more minutes. Pressure's on. Yeah, pressure's on. You're like, <laughs> I gotta go. Okay, now I'm gonna finish this thing out. Because if somebody sees something they want, they'll just break the window and take it anyway. So just leave it unlocked so they can just take it. And that way, it's gone either way and you don't have a broken window. <laughs> and so that's kind of, it's obviously not as extreme as that, but it, you know, a closed door is just a reason, you know, they yeah. come and they bang on the door. <laughs> the mischief. Yeah, the so that they it, can't go in there. Yeah, it's easier just to leave the door open so they can come in and then leave. <laughs> I have found. I treat the week like a traditional work week, and I work through the weekends. <laughs> so you're, you're good like, answer. You're like Lewis. <laughs> so the the goal is to eventually um, not do anything on Saturdays or <laughs> Sunday afternoons, but um, there's been so much. Uh, demand. Mm. I just, and I have made so many promises. I just have been, uh, been working 
pretty hard every day for a while now. Which is a good problem, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think so. I, I really, I really do uh, love it, you know, so. And I am pretty, part of the way I justify it is that I, I am at home mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm approachable when I, while I'm in the studio. Mm -hmm. So I, I do, I do hold the baby while I'm painting. <laughs> you know, so it's not like, it's not like uh, I'm at work in the same way that uh, in other professions you may have to be at work. I eat lunch with my family every day and I'm just around. So That's wonderful. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. It is. It's, it's really, it's a blessing. I'm very, very grateful that it's worked out this way. That's great. Have you found a community of artists in your area? I've heard rumors that there are artists in my area. I have not, I have not Legend found has them. it. I have not found them yet. So if any of them are watching, for goodness sakes, <laughs> get in touch. But yeah, no, I, um, I just, again, like I just, I've been so uh, sort of consumed with what I have to do in the studio that um, I don't even really know the lay of the land very well yet. So, and that's something that isn't sustainable, but um, I'm going to have to start painting Tennessee if I'm gonna live in Tennessee. Right. But for now, um, Carl Rungus was a, a sort of a big game painter. And he had a studio in New York City and he would fly out to the Rockies or I guess he wouldn't fly, he would probably go by train, I don't know if... Anyway, he would get out to the Rockies somehow, and uh, he would sketch little paintings all summer, and then when the first snow came, he would go back to New York City and turn his sketches and his big game studies into these large paintings that he would sell. So sort of uh, model, I'm kind of modeling my career after him right now. I paint really my studio in Tennessee. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> the winters are much more mild, right? Mm -hmm. They are much, much more mild, <laughs> and uh, all of my in-laws are much closer, which is nice. So just so you guys know, um, Ben, who asked about the um, cabin fever and depression question, he says, wow, thanks for the honesty on this, guys. It really helps me feel a sense of sol solidarity or something like that. It's awesome, man. It is always helpful when you realize that you're not the only one, right? That's right. I think this is the first time I'm seeing you wear gloves while you paint. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I touch their canvas quite often, so with lead wipe, it's a good practice to wear gloves. If you touch the canvas, it's an often it would. Do you wear gloves when you paint floral paintings as well? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Now that's lead white that you're actually using. Oh, uh, that's not right I'm using titanium, but no, there, yeah, there's times when. I have the stack lead white, and uh, yeah, same same kind of practice, same method. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, this has been great. Yeah. It's always fun when you have an awesome model. I'm just amazed at how fast you guys have worked and created such a likeness of her. 
also we tend to be very lucky if people are tuning in. Yeah. <laughs> Just got to keep going. <laughs> got to do it. The show must go on. Can't uh, sit around and... Ponder. Yeah. <laughs> sit there and stare off into the trees and think about what, <laughs> what to do. <laughs> Get depressed about the art world. Get depressed. Check Instagram. <laughs> the Charmalatha also says, very useful to know about your struggles as well. Thank you for sharing. Yep, you gotta, you gotta do it. You gotta share in proportion, though. <laughs> yep. Don't overshare. I don't, I don't overshare. In the sense that, like, it, it, oftentimes artists are very kind of they take a victim position, the mentality of like, why does the world like my art? Sometimes it's just because your art isn't good, you know, and you have to recognize that. You. Every artist wants collectors to buy their work, but sometimes you just have to realize that if your work isn't interesting or beautiful or something unique about it, people just may not want it. Can't force someone to buy something. Hmm. Are you going to tell your clients that work that you have free paintings of yourself now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I guess we all did. Do the people in the salon have the same uh, kind of conversations? Everyone's yeah. talking about hair and fashion. And yeah, style. <laughs> basically. <laughs> basically. Is that uh, like is price a thing for like how much you get, how much you cut hair for, and some people yeah. get it. You know. It like varies per level or like how long you've been doing it. Okay. So like the longer you've been doing it, like the um, higher your price can kind of go, and just like how many classes you've taken and stuff yeah. like that. And then are there like people who suck really bad at cutting hair, but then they sell their haircuts for like thousands of dollars? <laughs> Nobody <laughs> at my job has a thousand dollar haircut that I know of. Dun, dun, dun. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, nobody. Everybody's really good, actually, like, no lie. Like, everybody's talented. You should have told all of your coworkers to tune in to the collection. No, I will. I will. I'll get the link. <laughs> now that you've like said all good things about all the people in the room, <laughs> <laughs> like whew, I'm glad I said good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you guys don't screw it up. Yeah, at this point, that's how you feel. You're just like, okay, just, just finish. <laughs> don't, don't make mistakes. Carrie asks, what advice would you give to artists who live in very remote regions, that is no major galleries within a state or more, who would like to sell work in order to continue to work? Well, I mean, I think TJ would be able to answer that too very well. Uh, but I lived, I lived in pretty rural Mississippi areas for a long time, and um, and you know painted by myself, but found work in those areas, 
by just literally starting, you know, with one person and then another person and another person. And then before you knew it, I, I had like a whole like client base of people that were interested in what I did. Um, and uh, it was super helpful. Um, that was the question, right? Was what, what you wanted to yeah, so like, um, um, create work in a remote area? Right, if there are no major galleries and would the, like to sell work in order to continue to work. I tell you, the, the other thing is, is, I mean, internet's a powerful thing now. Um, it. And it really helps um, with a lot of artists' careers. Um, and I've I, even I found it helpful for my career because I do a lot even on Facebook. So uh, if I if I post something on Facebook, you know, and um, I'll typically have people see it and want to get work done. So um, it's good marketing. So yeah, the I live in a, a very remote area where there are no nearby galleries. You'd have to drive for an hour, I think, at least, to find a gallery. Um, and not all galleries are created equally either, you know. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. just because there's a gallery doesn't mean that they would be interested in your work or that you would be interested in working with them. But um, so I, I, I try to stay consistent posting and sharing on social media. So that other artists and uh, and all the all the galleries are on. I mean, almost all the galleries are on social media too. You know, they they have a presence. Uh, and then also entering competitions, I think, is a really good way to get your name out, and yeah. also gives you a resume. So, and that's that's something you can do no matter where you live. So that's, those are really, because um, even, even when I lived in Vermont, near, closer to the people who collected my work, the galleries didn't tell me who they were or where they lived. So that was still, but actually that's, that's a good, like, how is it for you, Michael? Because you've been, you've spent a lot of time in bigger urban areas. Mm -hmm. Do you think that made a difference, or did it not really? No, it's, it's, it's all about the work. I mean, it really is, because if you create a compelling image, uh, people are going to share it, and people are going to find out about your work, regardless of where you're at. If you only sell on the local market, that's just an entirely different um, kind of business model. You're like doing the art fair things where you're renting a booth and you're trying to sell your stuff for a couple hundred bucks. That's just totally different than um, making something, participating in uh, a tradition or a movement and making something that is uh, uh, you know, it's 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 understood and respected by people on an international audience. So they're just two different kind of things. It's Juliana O'Hara says, I've never seen a live model work so long without a break. Wow. <laughs> she's breaking. We're not that she mean. She has breaks, but she's doing a great job. Yeah. And then um, someone asked, are there any special techniques in getting people to sit for you, or do you guys always pay the model, or are the sitters a part of your social circle? You're doing this for free, right? <laughs> bribing, <laughs> bribing always helps. <laughs> yeah, I expect to pay a good model. That's just they, they earn it. Um, but if if you can paint your family, that's nice. I I do that a lot before. Um, but part of the struggle, you gotta figure out how to afford the models. And most mm -hmm. people take photographs. It's just kind of, it's, it's, it's so expensive.
getting we have two and a half minutes left. Two and a half minutes. So I think I'm about toast here. Interesting brush, uh, brush stroke, TJ. Oh, trying to mimic some of this hair in the last uh, minute here. Yep. Thirty seconds. No way. <laughs> last last chance. Going once, going twice. <laughs> I used three brushes the whole time. Look at that. I've got 47 in my hand. <laughs> hey! Right. Way Thank to you. go! Good job, guys. Way to go, Cabrina. Thank you so much. Great work. All right, guys. Thank you all so much for um, tuning in to this live stream. Um, you know, we wanted to, like, basically say the the last thing on here that anyone who still wants to get TJ's uh, live stream workshop is 35% off and the code, the promo code is, code is YouTube35. Also, if you want to paint along with this, the images are online on our website at eastoakstudio.com. All you have to do is put in your email and you'll have access to all of the Photos, reference photos, or most of the reference photos from most of the live streams we've done so far. So, thanks again, everyone. We look forward to the next time. Have a good one.